Hi, good morning. I'm just going to um, start um, the uh, the developers um, webinar in a, in a few minutes, but I'll just give um, people a little time to catch up. So I'm uh, so in the meantime, um, this webinar, as you know, we do it weekly. We do it live for the um, members, and then um, we put it out live later on, or sorry, we put it out onto YouTube later on for um, for everyone else. I do appreciate that we're actually, you know, we're getting a nice um, sort of following on YouTube, and, you know, there's some really nice chat, and people are asking questions. So um, if you are a YouTube um, follower, you you know, I've had some I've had some comments about people want to see um, webinars on fuel cells, um, and well, biofuel cells, and I think that's got um, an interesting um, comment, and I think we should do that. So, if you do have any thoughts about the kind of webinars that you'd like from Zimmer and Peacock, um, then yeah, please just put some comments um, in the comment section, and um, we'll try and accommodate some of those requests. So I think now we will um, I'll sort of start the, the, the main um, presentation. So today, um, welcome to the ZP Developer Zone. Like I say, this one is specifically for um, our members. And um, later on, it will go on to YouTube as well. I want to remind you that um, Hasim and Jati um, are in Indonesia. So if you're kind of interested in ZP um, and interacting with us in Indonesia, then we do have um, a Seaman Jati there, and um, it's, worth, it's worth, definitely worth reaching out to the guys. Um, as, as it says on the first slide, we are going to talk about um, halal um, census today. And it's really because um, one of our members, um, Siri, um, Hasim spoke to him, and I thought it was very intriguing, very interesting that he said that actually he was interested in um, halal sensors, and I thought, oh, that's really, um, I thought that's really interesting actually, because um, I could immediately see that you know biosensing could, um, yeah, could be used for um, for this type of application. So we are going to talk about halal sensors today, but I'll probably do a bit of housekeeping first of all, and just talk about. Um, a few things. I can just see that Sarif is online now, and it's cool. I just want to say hello to the guys. Right. So, um, so we are going to talk about um, halal sensors, and I think we're going to talk about um, a sensor for alcohol um, and a sensor for um, sort of adulteration or contamination of food with pigs, wine, and pork. You know, but basically, with this, you know, with um, with materials that come from pigs, which I was, you know, which I understand is you know, not acceptable. So we are going to talk about halal sensors, um, and we are going to talk about um, sensors for alcohol, and we'll talk about sensors for um, understanding whether there's um, contamination of pig, um, for example, uh, products into that um, food material. Now, I am going to say that actually the alcohol sensor is the much easier sensor and the, um, so the pig swine sensor, um, that, that kind of, that's actually a much tougher sensor. I think this is a really interesting idea because, um, as you know, many of you I know are in Indonesia um, and, for example, and you know, in total there's about 1.8 billion um, you know, Muslims in the world. So that really means this is a sort of a big, potential market. So in, in biosensing, people always say to us, well, what's the big market after glucose? Because glucose is, you know, diabetes is a big disease. Um, people have to test regularly. And then when I think about, for example, halal, I think, wow, well, actually, that's a population of 1.8 billion people. That is a big potential um, sensor user base. So it's actually really kind of interesting from a, um, from a business perspective. I just want to do some news first of all. So last week we um, we did a, a much more private webinar about um, some of the future events that for the developer zone. So we have the ZP developer zone, 
It's um, administered by Haseem. Um, and we were talking about things that we were going to do. And uh, we have a Discord server, and I did see some of the comments that something like Q3 next year in Jakarta seemed quite um, positive. So I really want to do that. So I think, obviously, we're saying Q3 because we, we understand there's a risk at the moment with sort of COVID-19 and the ability not to necessarily be able to fly everywhere. Um, but we are, I am personally quite keen to do that workshop and that conference in Jakarta, probably a two-day event. Um, it'll be for free for the members. Um, so, yeah, we'll be pushing that ahead. And I'll be asking for kind of a, a, an organizing committee and, you know, venues and stuff like that. Um, we've also got some collaborations going on now. So uh, I spoke to April this week, and that's, um, I think it's going to be very interesting. So if you're a ZP Developer Zone member and you're kind of interested in a collaboration, um, you know, let's let's have a chat with the team and let's have a chat with me and let's see if we can figure out a collaboration. So the whole idea of the ZP Developer Zone is to be, um, you know, is to be collaborative with our members. So I'm going to, I did use this slide last week. So, you know, we are, in, you know, we do have the Discord server. We do have these webinars and today's webinar is going to be a one, on, as I say, on Census and Halal. Um, hi, Dimas. Um, we also will, you know, now doing these collaborations. So we said that we would be interested in that and we are doing one with Avril. So we are, you know, people of our word. We do have this postdoc. So if you're in, um, if that's something interesting, let us know. Um, we have it, we, we're going to have this workshop in uh, Jakarta and we also offer discounts to members. And if there's something else that you want from Developer Zone, um, let us know. So as I say, so the main, the main um, topic today um, is going to be halal sensors and alcohol and pig, swine, and pork. Now, I know that if you guys have got any questions, in the, this obviously is going live. We're doing a live streaming at the moment. If you guys have got any questions, I'm just watching the, uh, the questions or the, the, the chat box. If you've got any questions, um, let me know. Um, so at ZP, you know, we're very interested in biosensors. There are electrochemical biosensors. And we have these sort of biological receptors that give us specificity. And so we definitely talked a lot about catalytic biosensors, and by that I mean these enzyme type biosensors, and then affinity biosensors. When we have an antibody that binds to an antigen, that would be an example of an affinity sensor. And affinity sensors, the first sort of few slides I'll talk about, and then we'll talk about um, catalytic sensors. But the affinity sensors are also um, very, very useful for people who are interested in sort of DNA. So obviously, um, pig has a specific genetic code. If the, if the food is adulterated with it, then there's a possibility of being able to detect the genetic code um, or the DNA for pig in the food. And that's good to probably do an affinity assay. So obviously, I did some research on this um, around the terms of the pork adulteration. You know, has pork made its way into the food chain? And um, you know, as always, then yeah, there's, there, there is plenty of papers around this. And in, in this particular paper, I've got several papers, but this one is kind of interesting for me because I thought what was interesting about it is that they have a um, it's a single strand of DNA. DNA um, single strand, and this is a fingerprint for pork. So in, um, we can detect um, pork adulteration or pork contamination just by spotting this um, code of DNA. And what I think is interesting about it is they're also mentioning gold nanoparticles. So whenever I see gold nanoparticles and I see DNA, I think to myself, yeah, this looks like it can become a an electrochemical biosensor of the sort of type that um, I like to be involved in. Um, I did a little bit more of a dig, um, a, a dig into this. I know this is a lot of material here, and I do have the reference from where I got this from. But what's interesting about this is we have definitely spoken about this kind of um, sensor in the past. You know, and you know, full credit to the authors, but you know, what they're saying here is obviously take a screen printed, and they actually use carbon electrodes. They functionalize the surface 
so that they can then um, bind the um, the sort of DNA of interest. Eventually, they find a way of, of um, binding the DNA of interest, and then when it um, hybridizes, they get a signal. So we have done a lot of these kinds of assays where you have a single strand of DNA, and for example, we often use um, ferro or ferricyanide, and that a ferro ferricyanide is happy to diffuse to the electrode and give us a signal. Now, when the complementary um, DNA comes along, it hybridizes, and we get a double strand of DNA, and that changes the ability of the ferro or ferrocyanide to diffuse to the surface. So we often make those types of sensors, and you could call them um, blocking assays, and the hybridization is a source of the signal, and we have a reporting molecule in the solution called a ferro or ferrocyanide. Um, now these guys do it quite similarly, except their reporting molecule is this ferrocene molecule, and it's intercalating into the um, double strand of DNA. I think this is quite an elegant way of doing it. It's a little bit harder because unless you can, it, it, you might have to end up making some of these compounds. So the so the the amount of like R and D that they have to do to get to the signal is higher than some of the methods that I suggest, but um, it, it does look like an elegant idea. So in the end, what they're doing is, their argument is quite simple, that they can make a sensor for, um, for the detection of, say, like pork, and they can do it by taking a carbon electrode, attaching a capture probe or a capture DNA probe, and then they it hybridizes with the, unfortunately, with the, with the poor DNA that shouldn't be in the product. That hybridization then changes the surface. And in their case, they are using a ferrocene molecule, which is electrochemically active. And it's, um, it's collating into the DNA strand. Um, so that's the way they're doing it. And if I was doing it, I would probably take their DNA capture probe and mobilize it onto a carbon or gold surface, then hybridize it with the target piece of DNA. Um, and I would, we would tend to use barrier ferrocyanide to report the change in the surface due to the hybridization. So this is in the literature and it's, um, it's a pretty good place to start. What I like about this is, you know, we are returning to common themes here, that. Often, you know, if you have an idea about what you want to sense, there will be an electrochemical way of doing it. And we can always bring it down to these kind of you know, screen printed electrodes and the idea of capturing uh, molecules and surfaces. It, it's, you know, it's a, recur a recurring theme. And it wasn't just the only paper I found on this. Uh, it was a pretty, this one was, um, actually really quite similar. That was a screen printed carbon electrode. Uh, I found it interesting because we have talked about gold nanoparticles. Um, one of the first webinars we did was on um, IDMAS, um, was on gold nanoparticles. And it returns again, you know, the idea of how do I make a nano surface was one of the questions we were asked. And it's, it's appearing here. Take a carbon electrode, they form um, nano pori particles of gold on the surface, and then they start forming this SAM layer, self assembler monolayers. Um, and we've definitely discussed self assembler monolayers quite a bit. Um, and then they start um, covalently attaching a here gold nanoparticles onto it with single strand DNA. So it's the same in the end, it's, it's, a, it's becoming a similar idea to the idea before that they're going to have a um, single strand of DNA specific to the um, to pig genetics. And when then when the pig DNA comes along, um, it hybridizes and changes the surface. And they do it using possibly um, either differential pulse voltammetry or square wave voltammetry. But they are they are the paper before was using I think differential pulse voltammetry and this paper is also probably using differential pulse voltammetry. 
So I really like the fact that, you know, I'm going to just repeat it a few times, but, you know, there's a continuity here that you can take a carbon electrode, you can, um, first of all, put the captured DNA on the surface, the, um, the article you talk is from Yanni's lab. That's <laughs> sweet. So I'm telling you guys something you already know. And Hasim's just told me that and it's from Yanni's lab. And I should have, yeah, that's Yanni's name. I didn't see. There you go. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's a small world. Um, yeah. So this is, um, this is somebody that um, Hasim knows um, is, is a good uh, interaction with us. So yeah, there you go. Now, I just brought this slide up just to say that, you know, I like the fact that we have these recurring themes, you know, that we have actually spoken about um, this kind of technology in the past. So you take a gold electrode, you form a SAM layer, you have a single strand of DNA, and then it, you know, get, you hybridize it, and you get a double strand, and that causes a change in the surface. And we used this slide when we were talking about um, impedance spectroscopy. So I just want to say that, you know, we are returning to these themes and that's okay because I think that electrochemistry and let's say the developers, the GP developers zone, we should have a toolbox. And even though the targets and the analytes might change, we should be able to, you know, go back into that toolbox and you know, reuse um, what's in that box. I do want, I do want to say that um, there are um, units on the market for doing um, electrochemical based um, genetic detection and there's um, there's a company called Genmark DX and then there's a um, these guys are in California and there's a company called DNA Nudge and these guys are in London. The reason I brought this slide up is these are well-funded companies um, and they you know they, they, they're kind of doing a good job on this stuff but it did take them a lot of investment in order to make DNA based biosensors. So I said at the, at the beginning of this presentation, um, you know, there's today we're going to talk about halal sensors, and we are, you know, and, and, and pork um, adulteration is important. It's also quite tough to do it by genetics, and companies do do genetic electrochemical tests, but they are well funded. So if I, I would, my advice would be, if you're going to make a halal sensor, then the, the first sensor I would going to recommend is. Um, alcohol. So I'll sort of switch gears now and talk about alcohol sensors. Now, this is a slide that I've used before, but you know, blood glucose meters where you take a drop of blood, you put it onto a biosensor, you have a little meter and you can read how much glucose is in the blood. This workflow and this technology can be exactly used for alcohol sensors. So what I mean by that is, you should be able to take a drop of a beverage, put it onto a little um, biosensor, and the meter should be able to tell you how much alcohol is in that um, product quite rapidly. And, you know, this is a slide I've used before, but we all know, and I'm just going to, you know, that glucose sensors can work by the idea of glucose being trans. Um, being transformed or catalyzed by the um, enzyme. And in that, in that transformation, the enzyme picks up the electrons and delivers them to oxygen, which becomes hydrogen peroxide, and the hydrogen peroxide is what we can detect. Ah, Sarif. Next paper should come from Sarif. Ah, brilliant. Okay. So the alcohol sensor, so the alcohol sensor, um, so this is how the glucose sensor works. And I just want to say that. The reason I have so much confidence in the alcohol sensor is it works in a really similar way. Um, I'm just going to jump a slide and kind of say, you know, there's, there is a, obviously a molecule known to you guys, alcohol um, oxidase, and it can convert alcohol. And in doing so, it can reduce oxygen to hydroperoxide, and therefore we can detect it. Um, on the Z, I'll just... I'll just um, the reason I have confidence in making alcohol sensors is um, if I just go to our website quickly, I'm just going to drag it on. So in the biosensors um, under uh, alcohol, you know, we do have, um, at ZP, we do manufacture alcohol sensors. So I do have a high confidence in being able to tell you that you should be able to make an alcohol sensor. 
Um, and I can give you confidence that they actually do work. I would definitely encourage you to make halal sensors and yeah, go go for the go for the um, go for the pool but it's a tough one and it'll be a tough one to actually make a product from you know and, and make a make a low cost product will be quite tough the alcohol sensor is quite doable um and and i just want to kind of also just sort of say that you know the on our website we do have um videos about people testing various types of sensors so you know, if, if you're wondering, you know, kind of how to do a first piece of R&D, you know, on an alcohol sensor, but in the video showing uh, Andre testing a glucose sensor, I've no actual this video before, so I'm not going to go over it again, but in this video, he has a glucose sensor, um, and I think you can make an alcohol sensor in a very similar way, just change the enzyme from glucose oxidase to alcohol oxidase, and then he just pipettes on, um, in the first instance, I think he's just pipetting on buffer. So he, he starts experiments, and then I think what he'll do is he'll add a bit of glucose in this experiment, and then the signal will jump up um, quite dramatically. So I'm just telling you, and you know, telling you something you probably know, that actually it's quite straightforward to be able to detect alcohol. So he's going to add the glucose in this instance, but the alcohol experiment would be um, pretty similar. So he protects it on, and then the sensor responds um, accordingly. So I'm just saying to you, yeah, alcohol is an easy target. I would recommend you did that as a, as a, as, as a first um, target. I'll pull that away because, so even though I say glucose here, um, if you watch those glucose videos, just imagine in your mind, that there's only one enzyme change and then you can do um, alcohol. And it's probably worth saying as well is, um, we have a slightly different part of our um, website, so I'll just drag that on. You know, how hard is it really to, to, at a laboratory level, to make some of these sensors? So this is Andre making a um, glucose sensor. So he takes one of these kind of um, electrodes um, and he's going to, you know, he describes the electrode to you. But what, he, what, what he's basically going to do in a minute is he shows you that we have basically two solutions, one that's a cross-linking solution and one that's the enzyme solution. And he literally um, will prepare them onto the um, electrodes, which is what he's doing here. He'll allow them to dry or to cure onto the electrode, and then he's made himself a, um, a in this instance, a glucose biosensor. So I want, I do want you to know that uh, laboratory-wise, it's not that difficult to make these types of sensors. Um, it's probably worth noting that, um, for example, you know, if you if you haven't got the lab facilities to do this kind of thing, um, you can. Uh, we do sell um, these types of formulations. If I look at biosensor activation um, solutions here, um, we do one, and I, I think one milliliter will approximately make about a thousand sensors. Um, I just want to give you a quick point that um, I think alcohol sensors are very doable. Why? Because they're very similar to glucose sensors. Um, we at ZP have a lot of experience of alcohol and glucose, and my recommendation would be to do the um, to make an alcohol sensor. I'm going to go back to the presentation now because, yeah, 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 yeah. So Hasim is just saying, yeah, post your questions here or jump to the Discord server because he's right, you know, we're. Um, this, is, this slide now is probably familiar to some of you because obviously I'd like to do my research when you guys ask us a question. And so I started looking for halal sensors and yeah, I find that. Obviously, you know, in Indonesia, um, this is a Dr. Madhu um, at IPB. I definitely like to meet this this, um, this gentleman, um, and he has made a halal alcohol sensor. Now he's done it using technology similar to what I speak about, but he has done it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He seems saying I have a cyanide centre for him. Sweet. Um, Dr. Madhu has said, you know, has made this alcohol sensor and he's done it on what's called a biofuel cell. So we haven't talked about biofuel cells, but I think we will end up talking about biofuel cells. But it's essentially um, what happens is he's able to, um, the alcohol is a source of um, fuel for him and it generates a voltage and a current and he's able to read it. It is very similar to what we, what we do at ZP except he's running in what sort of biofuel format. But um, it is interesting that he did it in the, in the um, it is from Dima's office, there we go. <laughs> it's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, IPB, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so um, Dima, if you know this Dr. Madhu, I'd be quite interested in um, meeting him at some point. Um, I think this is kind of interesting. So I wanted to give recognition to that, you know, because somebody has done that sort of product in the past and, and we have to recognize that. Um, I would be interested in partnering people to actually, you know, go to market with something like that. So I think, you know, this was a very interesting technology. I'm not sure that it's being commercialized. Um, and we potentially should all have a conversation about this. Um, so I, in conclusion, as, as the scene says, um, you know, we'd like to do this for 30 minutes. So the halal, um, Sense is very interesting to us. I mean, there are it is a big market. You know, there's 1.8 billion Muslims in this world. I think the alcohol sensor is fairly easy, and I think it's fair to say, you know, that the work from IPB, you know, demonstrates that that can be done. The alcohol sensor can be done. I think the DNA detection for pig adulteration uh, to, to take it from a lab and make it into a product that is quite tough. So I would, you know. It can be done, and you know, DNA Nudge is a good example of this kind of work, and Jeremiah Piet is a good example, um, but it's pretty tough. Um, but I definitely think that um, an alcohol sensor, for example, could be integrated into something like food sense, um, and I think the work from IPB you know, demonstrates that you can do it in a handheld device like that. So I've put the Discord uh, server link there, just to say yes, as the team is saying, um, any questions, um, let me know in the Discord server. Um, I would like to, I'm going to talk to Haseem about it, but put together an organizing committee for um, a developer zone uh, conference or workshop in probably Jakarta in Q3 next year. Um, so. If you want to be involved in the organization of it and or you want to attend, then please let uh, Seam and I know through the Discord server and we're going to start that for you. All right. So no questions, but Sarif, thank you very much um, for the for the idea for today's topic. Um, I am you know, very interested in this. And if you've got any questions, um, let us know. I'll post this on YouTube um, in about 30 minutes and I'll also be I'll also share the notes through the Discord server. So these notes will be available to you members through the Discord server. So there'll be a link going up there shortly. All right. Um, as always, um, thank you for, um, very much for seeing and the guys. Um, and I'll speak to you soon enough. And I will be on Discord as well.